Welcome everyone. You are here with Bright Lights and our final flip side camp for the summer. So you want to become better at drawing. My name is Renee and I'm the education coordinator for Bright Lights and I'll be serving as your behind the scenes host. And my friend Miss Lori will be helping with on screen hosting duties. I want to just cover a few things before we get started and then I will turn this over to Mr. Reeker so the drawing fun can begin. Remember we're in a webinar format which means we can't see your picture or hear you but that's okay if you want to ask a question or comment just use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen type in your question or your response or your comment and then we will see it and relay that to Mr. Reeker and or uh, identify your name and your answer. I also want to let you know that we're recording the session. We'll have a link in a few days on our YouTube channel to this Flipside Camp so you can watch it again or so you can invite some friends to watch it if you want to. Remember we have all of our Flipside Camps on our YouTube page so that you can go back later this summer and maybe retake one of the ones that you enjoyed the most. Finally, I'd like to thank Black Hills Energy for supporting Bright Lights and sponsoring our Flipside Camps this summer. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Reeker and Miss Lori. Good morning, Mr. Reeker. Hey, good morning, Renee. Thank you so much. Hi, Lori. How are you today? I'm great. How are you? You know, I'm doing well. I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. That way uh, people can see what it is we're talking about. And Lori, awesome. after we talk here for a minute or so, I'm going to go ahead and hide our photos. That way all the kids and anybody who's watching can see the slides a little easier. Does that work for you? Perfect. That's perfect. Great. Great. Hey, kids, welcome today. Um, so you might be asking yourself, you know, how do I become a better drawer? And today we're going to give you some strategies for how to do that. Now, Lori, you and I have been on a class together this summer, and I saw your drawing. You're actually really pretty good. I, um, I love to do creative things. So I enjoy that. And I think sometimes when you really enjoy something, it, it makes it better. You just really get something fun out of it. Yeah. So when you're crafting and, and uh, drawing, wh what has it, wh what have you done that's made you better at it? What have you done to do that? Well, I have to tell you that several years ago, I wanted to learn to knit. And so I, I got the supplies and I watched some videos and I started and I still have the first scarf I made that was just full of holes. And because I dropped a stitch, dropped a stitch. And now when I make a scarf, it's perfect, but I've probably made 40 scarves in between there. So I think it's just practice, practice, practice. That is so key. We know whether it's cooking or playing basketball or learning to read, it's doing it over and over and over again. And that's really what we're going to kind of focus on today. So I'm glad you're with us. And kids, I'm glad you're all with us today. So let's uh, enjoy some time together over the next hour or so, okay? So um, just to let you know, uh, my name is Bob Reeker. For the, any of you that are my students, Mr. Reeker. And you probably saw some artwork behind me because I've been a teacher for 30 years and I've been an artist. And I have three paintings here that I just did recently for my niece. She requested these paintings. And these were done in a way, a strategy that I'm gonna show you today. So as you're looking at these pictures, be thinking through today's presentation, which of the techniques did Mr. Reeker, Bob, use in order to create these images? Let's get started. Mm. Today's learning targets. You're going to read the red parts, please. Number one, know about the of Betty Edwards. Understand there are strategies and techniques for. And number three, be able to strategies and techniques to improve your drawing. So we're hoping that by the time we're done together in the next hour, you will have some knowledge about Betty Edwards and be able to understand and use three different strategies and techniques. So let's begin with a that's me. Now, I know you're not gonna be able to hear others in the class as they respond, but if any of these pertain to you, just in your own space, um, if it's okay for you to yell it out, go ahead and do that. Otherwise, whisper it to yourself. But any of these statements that pertain to you, say that's me. Here's number one. I remember things due to my good memory. That's me. That's me. Number two, when traveling, I notice new things around me. That's me. <laughs> Number three, I have a great imagination. That's me. That's me too. Number four, 
I prefer two-dimensional work like painting and drawing over three-dimensional work. Number five, I prefer three-dimensional work like sculpture or building. That's me. That's me. And finally, number six, I love drawing and can't wait to start. That's me. <laughs> That's me too. <laughs> you know, Lori, I know we can't hear each other or see each other, but I have a feeling that out of the, boy, do, what do we have, 18 people with us? I'm going to guess that we found that a lot of us had a lot of these similarities. In fact, Lori, you probably heard you and I even had some of those similarities as we were going through them, didn't we? We sure did. And I have a hard time answering those because I really like drawing and painting, but I really love sculpture and multimedia. So it was hard to answer that because I think my answer is, it's all me. <laughs> yes, and I totally get that. And I'm certainly not asking anybody to choose one over the other. It's just right. sometimes we're kind of more predisposed to maybe drawing and painting versus maybe building, and that's okay. Um, but a lot of people I bet they're out there, and I bet some people even said, that's me to number four and number five, and that's okay. So the reason we do this is because even though you can't see or hear each other, I bet there are kids out there that are different than you, but some of these are the same, even though you might have different backgrounds. I think that's really important to always remember. All right, so our first learning target was to just know a little bit about Betty Edwards. Betty Edwards uh, was a teacher and researcher. She did a lot of her work many, many years ago long before most of you were born, like in the 60s and 70s. I know I was born in the 60s, and so I would have been alive when Betty Edwards was doing this work. Um, but a lot of her work is still usable today. She wrote a book called Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. So the idea was for uh, asking people who wanted to get better at drawing to think about drawing in a different way. You might have heard that our brain has two hemispheres or two sides to it, and the old way of thinking about the brain said that our left side of the brain was more analytical, like doing math and science, and our right side of the brain was more about music and dance and visual art. You know, our new research says we actually need our whole brain to do a lot of things that we do. In other words, um, our synapses, the connections that we're making in our brain happen across the vortexes back and forth. So if you're going to be getting better at drawing, you know, some of that activity happens in the right side of the brain, but you also need your left side of the brain that's going to take care of some of those systems and ideas that you're going to do. So as Lori kind of said, you know, the idea of practice and thinking about drawing in a different way, those were key in Betty Edwards' work. Lori, had you ever heard of Betty Edwards before? I haven't. That's okay. To me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's real interesting. The book that she wrote is not necessarily for elementary kids, um, but you could certainly do research on her and find out more if you're interested about some of Betty Edwards' work because it's, it's really fascinating and, and it's uh, worth looking at if uh, you, you're interested in the topic. Yeah. Um, Edwards then, through her research, discovered that there were several techniques or strategies to improve drawing ability. Now, I'm only sharing three of those today and you're gonna practice three of them. There are others, but these are the three that I focused on with my elementary kids at Elliott Elementary and other schools that I taught at uh, because they seem to be more age appropriate. Um, but if you really like some of her work, you could go in and look at some other things. So here are the three. One is called upside down drawing. Number two is blind contour. And number three is continuous line contour. We're gonna talk about each one and we're actually gonna give you a few minutes to practice each one of these as we go through. So I'm going to play this little video, which is a demonstration on how to do upside down drawing. Here we go. The first kind of drawing I'm going to demonstrate for you today is upside down drawing. You can find a very simple black and white image either from a coloring book or if you go in and search something on the internet, but try to find something that um, is relatively simple probably black and white um, that you can readily draw uh, and see the lines pretty easily. So it's right side up right now. I'm going to flip it around because you want to draw it upside down. That's the name of it. Let me set this off to the side just a little bit while I draw so you can see what I'm doing. I'm going to talk you through what it is that this kind of activity or strategy helps you do. As I'm drawing, I'm looking for places where I see lines that are straight, lines that are curvy. I'm looking for shapes as well as I'm drawing. 
And probably most importantly, I'm looking at the relationships of those lines and shapes to one another. Hmm. So by turning your image upside down, your brain is taking it in in a different way. My brain isn't necessarily reading this as branches and a trunk. What it's really doing here is it's reading it as more as lines and shapes. And most importantly, what are those relationships between those lines and shapes? By recognizing those, you are able to get a more uh, more of a likeness uh, to your drawing than potentially if you were drawing it right side up. Now, I'm not going to draw the rest of it, but when you're done, if you flip over your drawing as well as your uh, image, you might see that you've done pretty good job if you were focusing on lines, on shapes, and on those relationships between lines and shapes. All right, Laurie, what did you think about what you just saw? Well, it's interesting because I thought, well, it'll just be a copy of what you did. But really, it's how your brain works that I realized as I was watching that. That when I look at a picture right side up, I think of the whole thing and it sometimes feels overwhelming. But when you turn it upside down, that looked a lot easier to draw than it did when I was looking at it right side up. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you're right on with what Betty Edwards was saying. Right side up, we read it as a tree with a stump and branches and leaves. But once you turn it upside down, you still know it's an upside down tree, but your brain looks at it differently. You're more focusing on line shapes in those relationships. So we're going to give everyone a chance here to do a little bit of drawing with some upside down. So um, make sure you have your drawing tool and your paper surface. Doesn't matter. It could be crayon, marker, pencil, pen. You decide. We're not worried if you make a mistake because remember this is about practicing. So if you make an error, just keep going. Don't, don't worry that this needs to be a finished piece of artwork. Um, you will need maybe a page from a coloring book you have around you, or if you have an iPad or some other device that you can look up. I like to look up the name of what I want to use and then use like the words black and white and clip art, and that will give you some really great imagery. Um, and then you're going to start drawing. I want you to draw slowly. You're going to closely observe line shapes and then the relationships of those lines and those shapes. So real quick, I'm just going to show you here. I went ahead and I'm using my iPad and um, I wanted to do a dolphin. And so I just simply put in dolphin clip art, black and white, and this is the image that came up. Now, unfortunately, when I go to flip this, my dolphin flips over, right? So I'm going to lay it down on the table and then I'm going to be able to draw it upside down. Now, don't cheat. The image should be upside down. You're going to draw it upside down and then you're going to turn it around. So uh, let me hide this again. What I've done is I'm going to set a timer here for three minutes. We're going to have some nice music because sometimes music is kind of relaxing as you're drawing. And I just want you to take three minutes practicing drawing. And then Lori, we'll check in on you. Yeah. If you're willing to kind of share what you drew, we'd love to see it. Oh, okay. Only if you're comfortable. It's not required. I'm comfortable. Care. Okay. I am comfortable. Read. Three minutes of drawing time. Okay.
If you get one drawing done, you might redraw it again or find another image and draw a new one. Remember, practice makes you better. About 40 seconds left before we'll come back together. I don't know about you, Lori, but I find music to be really calming um, in uh, lots of ways, and including music. I don't know if you you find that to be true for you too. I do. I, I have to admit, I kind of fall asleep to some soothing music like that. Nice. So that I, background white noise is sometimes really helpful, isn't it? Yeah, I was getting sleepy there a little bit. <laughs> hey, before we reveal, I know we've got a lot of great friends out there, but I want to give a shout out to Connor Wade, because I know he's joining. I have good friends with his mom, Candy, so I just wanted to say hi to Connor. Awesome. And I'm glad everybody is with us today. We're, we're just thrilled that you're here. Lori, do you want to share? Are you willing to share what you drew? Yeah. So I found just like a black and white um, drawing of a cat and a dog, kind of. And I'm going to see if I can show that in a way. So it's kind of like an outline. Yep. Uh, the cat is inside the dog and it looked pretty difficult but then when I turned it upside down when I was drawing it like this it was just big lines yeah. then I tried to do another dog let's see if I can yep yeah I can see it yep and it was just it felt like lines yeah so, I love this upside down thing because it when I turned it around I'm like that looks like the picture yeah, well, I, I, you nailed, I think you nailed a really good point, which is when it's right side up, I think in our brains, we say it's got to look just like it, right? But when we turn it upside down, we're saying to ourselves, wait a minute, what if I'm drawing it upside down? I don't necessarily have to worry about that because it, I'm not even looking at it right side up. I just think there's something in our brain that does, does that. And then I think the other piece is some kids may say, my art teacher doesn't ever let me copy things. Well, keep in mind, these aren't necessarily meant to be finished artworks. They can be, but they're not. This is more about you practicing. So you're using images maybe that belong to other people, but it's more about practice than thinking about making, you know, a final thing. So you remember my dolphin, right? So there mm -hmm. it is upside down. You know, I had it on my screen. And then once I turn it right side up, you know, I, I got a pretty good likeness because yeah. again, I was looking at the lines and the shapes and the relationships between those. I think that's just so key. Lori, I'm glad you're putting yourself out there and doing this with us. This is great. <laughs> I, I love to try things. And, and as a kid, I was always encouraged to just try it. What's the worst yeah. thing that could happen? Yeah. And I hope that boys and girls um, that are with us today are feeling that same way. I hope so too. And you know, I always applaud adults for doing this because there's a certain point at an age around 12, 13, 14, where either kids say, I'm really good at being creative and drawing and painting, and they go that route or they decide I'm gonna do other things like cooking or playing sports or focusing on math and they go that direction. And so I love when I hear adults that, you know, are going out there and trying it themselves. So that's really awesome, glad you're doing it. How about we try another one? I'm ready. Okay, let's do it. Okay, this next one's called blind contour drawing. This one's really interesting. It's gonna be important that you watch my face in this drawing and notice what I'm doing as I am drawing. Here we go. Okay. So here I am in my office studio and I'm about to show you the next technique of drawing and that is called blind contour. The key piece to this kind of strategy is you're not going to worry about looking at your paper. Your focus is going to be on your object. Now I picked a shoe, hands work great for this, uh, plants, stuffed animals, anything that's more organic is probably going to uh, work better for this. Um, but you can really draw any object you want to. So I'm going to sit this here. And the reason I'm recording it this way is I want you to watch my eyes uh, because this is going to be the key thing, right? I may run off my paper, so I'll have to bring it back on, but that's okay. So I'm going to have a starting point here, and you're going to just watch my eyes and what I'm doing, okay? 
One of the things that's important on a uh, blind contour drawing is that you go slowly. You don't pick up your writing device, so it's just a continuous line. Mm. It's similar to the technique that you are going to do after this one. That means you're going to have to add in additional lines that you may not need, but that's all right because you're not picking up your device, you're not gonna be able to avoid those kinds of lines. Again, I'm going slowly. My eyes, every time I see a curve, I'm drawing the curve. Every time I see a straight line, I'm drawing a straight line. If I see a bump, I'm drawing the bump. I'm not worrying about what's happening on the paper. So you can probably start to figure out, hmm, is this drawing going to look just like the shoe? Think about that. All right, I'm gonna draw for about 10 more seconds here, and I'll show you the drawing. There we go. All right, let's show you this drawing. <laughs> There you have it. Now use your imagination a little bit. You should be able to kind of pick up on what you see in terms of the shoe here, in terms of its uh, shapes, the lines that I created. Yeah. The key piece was I was concentrating what I was looking at and not on the drawing. Too many times artists are concerned about what we're putting down on the paper that we kind of not look at the things we're trying to draw. So this technique of blind contour drawing really focuses this idea on study the object. Don't worry about what's on the paper. I personally think these are beautiful drawings um, and they could turn into artworks that you could actually color in if you want to, you could hang on the wall, um, but they can just be studies too. Because then my next step might be to turn the page and then draw it as a con regular contour without uh, looking only at the shoe. I could be looking at the paper and at the shoe, right? So that technique is called blind contour drawing. Let's give it a shot. So Lori, what are your thoughts about this strategy or technique? Well, at first when you turned it around, I thought, well, that doesn't look like a shoe. Mm -hmm. I realized quickly, it doesn't necessarily have to look like a shoe. That is correct, that's right. But as you looked at it, could you kind of see what I was going for? I could, and then I just kind of started looking at the shape and I thought that's kind of a cool shape with cool lines and that'd be fun to color in or to enhance. Exactly, because it becomes a very abstracted kind of drawing. Some might even use the term non-representational, which just means lines and shapes. It's not supposed to represent something. So I think it's a cross between something that um, doesn't represent anything, but then also it's kind of abstracted because I am using the shoe as inspiration and motivation. So how about mm -hmm. we give this one a try? Are you ready? I am ready. I have my object and I'm ready. Excellent. Okay, so it's, you're going to be turn your time to draw just like before. You have okay. your drawing tool and your paper service. Maybe you're even going to use the back of the paper that you did the upside down drawing on. That's great because remember these are practice. This is not something that needs to be a finished work unless you choose to make it that way. You know, I really recommend organic objects things that have lots of bumps and curves. So things like shoe, maybe your hand, um, a shell, a plant, a flower, a leaf. Now you can do like a water bottle or a lamp or something like that, that's fine. Um, but you challenge yourself more if you do an organic kind of shape. And then draw slowly, closely observe lines and shapes. But remember, don't look at your paper. I do this with my third, fourth and fifth graders almost every year. Boy, can I tell the people that cheat. Don't cheat on this. If, I, if you look at your drawing when you're done and you go, oh, all the lines kind of match up, then you probably cheated by looking at the paper. Don't worry about that, right? Um, I have done probably hundreds, if not thousands of these drawings. My drawings always look like the one, the shoe that I showed you in the video. So Lori, <laughs> real quick, what um, object have you chosen for this? Yes, yeah, so I have a, um like a measuring cup, but it's got like curves on the top. So I thought that'd be fun. And it has a fancy handle, if you can see that. And so that's what I chose to draw because I liked the, the shape on the top. 
That's excellent because it's not just a rounded kind of form, right? It's got some scallop. It's got some intricate detail. And so that makes it a little more organic, doesn't it? I think I'm actually yeah. going to use my hand. I'm going to put my hand in kind of an interesting position and I'm going to draw using my hand, okay? okay. But shoes, stuffed animals, any of those things will work. So just like we did before, we're going to give you three minutes. I think I might have some, I don't know if I have different music, but we have music <laughs> for you while you're drawing. So go ahead. You have oh. three minutes and we'll okay. check back in with everybody here shortly. Less than a minute on this practice, keep going. You can do it. If you're done, start a new one. Your hand is always there with you. So you can do that. You can take your sock off and draw your foot. Maybe the pile of laundry that's sitting in the corner that you need to get washed later today. That can be a great subject for these kind of drawings too. Renee, before we share out here, is there anything in the chat that would be helpful as we're going along? Any questions or comments that would be helpful? No questions. We've had, um, Bryn is using a peach for her, um, her upside down, what, let's see, image or, or, or piece, but she's also eating it for breakfast. So I said that was a good use of double duty. Uh, Connor noticed that this looks very abstract. Um, and somebody, I think Amber is using a marigold mm. for Ooh. her. Yeah, which I thought was really interesting, would give you some interesting lines. So yeah, I think people, honestly, it's quiet in chat because I think people are drawing. I agree. Oh, good. I love to hear that because that uh, tells me they're practicing. They're trying to get better, right? That's really key. So Lori, are you willing to share this one? Because I know you had your yeah. cup. Please yeah, do. I had my cup. So here's my cup. Yep. And then here, let's see. There we go. Oh. And I love I didn't realize there'd be so many squiggles, but I decided that's how I would draw the flowers and the edges. And I kind of love the shape of it. Yes. And I can tell you didn't cheat. I can tell that you were really <laughs> focusing and drawing what you saw. That is a lovely drawing. Those lines are just really strong and, and fun to look at. Yeah, they're kind of, um, 
it, it, it wasn't what I thought it would look like. It's funny right. to think about, oh, here's what I think it's going to look like when I get done. Mm -hmm. But I realized that there are so many curves in the pattern and the top that, of course, it looks like this. So I kind of yeah. love it. Good. Oh, I like that. Great. Here's my hand. Oh. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I think that one looks more like a hand than my shoe looked like the shoe, right? I mean, I just yeah. think you have enough information. But see how it was just, just like you, that one continuous line. So there were places where I went back in and had to add extra lines, and that's okay. That's going to be key on the next uh, technique we draw as well, okay? I'm just not used to not picking up my instrument, and yeah. that was hard for me. I kind of would have to, like, stop and think, don't pick it up, don't pick it up. <laughs> yeah, right, because once you pick that up, then you want to go look and try to put it back to where it was, right? But it's just yeah. like, let the line, and if you make a mistake, who cares, right? This is about practicing and getting better because you're training your eye to look closely. That's the key piece with that one. So, excellent. Hey, how about we do our third one? Yes. Now, this one's going to connect nicely to the one we just did. The difference with this one is you're actually looking at your paper and your object. So, this one should not be a far stretch from what you just did. Here's another okay. little video clip. Our next strategy or technique is called continuous contour line drawing. Um, I've chosen a stuffed animal because of its organic shapes, its curves, uh, its round and oval sh uh, shapes, uh, rather than picking something like a glass um, or a lamp. It's kind of nice to draw organic shapes. The key thing to this, again, just like in some of the others, is you're looking for lines, you're looking for shapes, you're looking for relationships. But with continuous contour line drawing, you are never picking up your device as you're drawing, all right? I'm going to be looking closely at my uh, stuffed animal as well as my drawing. So my eyes, even though you can't see what my eyes are doing, they are going back and forth. And I'm really just trying to capture what it is that I see without lifting up my drawing device. So I'm, I'm going to potentially be adding more lines in than I possibly need. And that's okay. That's part of this experience is because I'm not picking up and I'm focusing on just a fluid continuous line, I'm going to potentially be adding in things that I wouldn't normally see. Oh. Like I'm going in on this little beak here and I drew a line to get to the beak and that's okay. And for these little nostrils, uh, where the nostrils are, I had to kind of draw in for those. That's okay. That's part of the process. By doing this, you're getting a really nice, interesting fluid line. I can go back over lines if I need to, but it just provides me with a very fluid line in creating, all right? Again, not going to finish it, not necessary. I just needed you to be able to see what it looks like to create a continuous contour line drawing. So, Lori, what are your impressions of that technique? Um, well, it kind of feels like a combination of some of the things that we've already done. I like that, kind of building on that. Um, I will say that the perfectionist in me is uncomfortable with extra lines. And so this will be a good practice for me. Yes. Do you mind sharing what is your plan for what it is that you're going to use to draw? I have a little uh, stuffed unicorn here. So I'm going to use nice. him. Nice. Some of you may know Bob Ross, right? So yeah. I've got a little bobble, bobblehead Bob Ross that my daughter gave to me for Father's Day. So, and he's oh, funny because if you press the button, he says things. Yeah, something about uh, being successful if you try. So that's what I'm <laughs> going to draw here. So he, ma he makes me laugh. All right, let me hide here. Let me give you a couple directions and then we'll give you three minutes to draw. Okay, just like before, make sure you have what it is you're drawing. Um, almost any object around you is gonna work. Again, I encourage organic things, but you use what you have around you. I think food is a great thing. If you're eating breakfast, draw that bowl of cereal that's sitting there before it gets too soggy. And then as I've said, Draw slowly, observe lines, shapes, and relationships, and try not to lift up your drawing tool. Wow, I think I'm hearing some of the same directions over and over and over again. That's part of Betty Edwards' work, is this repetition of things, all right? All right, another three minutes to draw. 
got some more music here for you. Enjoy continuous line drawing. Less than a minute left. If you're done, go ahead and grab something else to draw. Let's see what you did, Lori. Okay, I have a unicorn head. Let's see if I can show it. Nice. And then I started on this, I have a greeting card here and it had the picture. And so I started on the guy's face from the greeting card, um, which I'm kind of digging this one lion thing. It, it's more fun than I thought it was gonna be. Yeah, there's a real fluidity to it, isn't it? Because yeah. again, you're not worrying about picking up that pen or marker. You just got to know that if I add an extra line, it just is part of the process and it's okay. Not a big deal. Yeah. Here's my bobblehead. Ooh. Yeah, it was fun to draw. He's kind of yeah. tiny, so I had to really use my eyes closely, but it was he was a fun little thing to draw. Little figurines like this are really, really awesome to do. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you've enjoyed all three of the processes. Oh, they're um, fun and interesting. Yeah, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to be playing a video here for the next few minutes. And while we're doing this, um, I want you to go ahead and practice some more, right? Go back and do the upside down drawing again, maybe using the same image or something else. You know, try the blind contour again with the same object or pick out a different object or uh, try the continuous line drawing, but pick out the one that you uh, like the best and then we'll check it back in. This slide is out of order, so I apologize. Um, uh, but we'll come back to that. I found this really awesome little video here on suggestions on how to improve your drawing ability. Not Betty Edwards, but some other researchers that found other ways to do it. So go ahead and either watch or draw while you watch and uh, we'll just enjoy this video for the next few minutes. Maybe. 
Oh, here it is. It didn't go to the right link. You know, sometimes technology does not go exactly the way you want it. So we'll skip the ad here in just a second. Okay, class, let's count these munchkins together. One, two, three. That looks fun. This video is not about what you are seeing on screen. This is just some old footage that I put together because the real focus of this video is about what I'm going to say. This is for anyone who is interested in drawing and who wants to improve and get better. It's not just about drawing though. This video could also be of use for anyone who wants to get better at something. Drawing is just the example I'm using because the content I make is usually related to the subject of drawing and being creative. The reason I have created this video is to give some advice on the things I have learned from my experience with drawing. I create a lot of realistic drawings, which is a style of working among all the others out there. It's not the only way of working. There is a wide variety of different styles and different artists who create their own artwork. But whether you are interested in realistic drawing or not, I hope that the advice I give in this video can be of some use. So let me get a piece of paper and a pencil. I'll do some drawing. And over that, I can talk about what you should do to get better at it. So I've decided to put this one first because I think it's essential if you want to learn and improve at a fast rate. And that is to draw every day. It might sound like a bit of a task to make time to draw every day, but it doesn't have to be a full drawing. It could be as simple as creating a small sketch in a sketchbook or doodling on a piece of paper. As long as you put yourself in the process of either studying the subject or an image and drawing it, or even drawing from memory using your imagination. Drawing is about the process, and the more you do it, the more natural and easier it will become. It doesn't have to be a different drawing every day. Instead, you can work on one drawing at a time. Carrying out the act of drawing each day will help you improve really fast. Don't worry about not being happy with a drawing or how it looks. The result doesn't matter because it's a process of learning. Just draw and keep drawing, and over time you'll improve. Next up is being patient, which is essential not just in the drawing process, but also whilst you are learning. It's not going to happen overnight, so you have to be patient and put in the work to improve. You also have to be patient during the actual drawing process. For instance, if you are working on a big drawing with a lot of detail, it's going to take a long time and you will most likely end up working on it over a few days. I've had drawings that I work on over a few months, taking over a hundred hours, so patience is important. And I suppose that almost ties into dedication as well. I think when patience and dedication come together, you can guarantee that the end result will always be better. And that's because when you allow yourself the time to improve and you still dedicate time to practice in your craft, eventually the results will naturally show and you will no doubt improve with whatever it is you are practicing. All right, so the next one, don't be afraid to make mistakes. It's a common phrase to not be afraid of making mistakes, but this goes a long way in learning to draw. As you are learning and improving, you are no doubt going to make a lot of them, and that's perfectly normal. But it's really the perspective you have on making them that matters the most, because some people lose confidence when they make mistakes. Maybe a drawing doesn't look quite as good as they had hoped, and so they decide not to try again. You see these types of situations a lot, and so you need to change the outlook you have on it. You can't practice anything without making mistakes at first. It's the way it works, and the more you practice, the less we make them. And that's because we learn from them. So if you draw something and you aren't happy with the result, see it as a step forward. Look at where you went wrong and why you don't like it. Try and recognize your weaknesses, and then you can work on improving them. Don't feel discouraged, especially when it comes to drawing, because no matter how it looks, it's still a drawing at the end of the day. As long as you are practicing, you are doing the best thing you can. So keep making mistakes and keep trying. So this one is something that will improve your creativity and inspiration is. So Renee and Lori, I think for the sake of time, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and put this in the chat. Is that okay, Renee, this link? Yeah, that's perfect. Then they and can that way, if they want to go back. It. And, yep, they can finish watching it because the other three, I think, are equally as important. Um, but I know that our time is running low and I still have a couple more things that I like to do. But I think, you know, we heard some key things, right? drawing every day, um, you know, being okay with mistakes because they are going to happen. Um, and oops, I got to change this to all panelists and attendees. There we go. Um, and then uh, just be patient with it. You know, patience is a key piece to this. So I would encourage that if an adult says it's okay for you to watch the rest of this video, 
So feel free to do that because I think that's a key, uh, key thing to, you know, look for those resources that are going to actually help you. That, that's an important piece to it. Um, we, I know we have adults listening, and I know I shared this with my previous one, but I want to go through this very briefly. So adults, if you are within earshot, go ahead and uh, just be listening. And I'll also throw this in uh, the chat as well. Uh, I think I can do a PDF or a file. If not, Renee, I think we can put this somewhere, right, this resource? Yeah, I think that we had, I think we might have posted it on the first camp that you did. I'll yep. do a little look in here and then if okay. I find That's it, great. I will put that in the chat. That'd be awesome and I can reshare it with you too if necessary. So, okay, so adults, listen up. There are six things that you can do if you're trying to promote uh, creativity at home with your youngster. One, focusing on being a facilitator, not a manager. Let the child control the direction of what it is. Now that doesn't mean we can't teach them. That doesn't mean we can't encourage them uh, to look at things more closely. But ultimately, the child is the person that should be uh, engaged and be involved in kind of the decisions that they're making. So if you want to be a facilitator, you want to try to provide um, open-ended ideas and inspirations to allow for those individual solutions. Don't have a predetermined idea of what it is that the artwork will become. Adults are very well known to have this idea that a piece of artwork needs to look a certain way. Children don't necessarily have that way of looking at things. And so we want to allow that to kind of happen naturally. Um, and then allow for struggle. It's okay for kids to struggle through things. That's part of that mistake piece, right? So when problems and mistakes happen, let the child kind of work through it. Now, we don't want crying and, and tears and, and temp temper tantrums because something's not working. Um, but if we can allow some of that productive struggle to happen, and then come in as a support, uh, that's gonna help the child down the road in lots of things that go even be, beyond drawing. Uh, talk about it, you know, take some time to help the child reflect and visit about experiences. This can happen during creating or when the piece is done. So what inspired the child to create? What problems did they encounter and how did they solve them? Um, if the child was gonna make it again, what would they change? What is their favorite part? What's their least favorite part? And most importantly, why? Why is it their favorite part? Why is it their least favorite? It helps them to think a little more deeply. What title might you give it is a great question to have. Um, we're gonna talk about presenting, but where in the home would the child want to present that piece of artwork? So talking about the process and the product is important. The third one is providing artistic inspiration for creating. There's a saying that says, um, in order to make good art, you really do need to look at good art. So you can do that through the internet, through books, and even going out and looking at public art. I know a lot of our museums and galleries are not open yet, um, but boy, there is some great artwork that's in the uh, community of Lincoln. And even if you're not from Lincoln, wherever you are, go out and search out those murals, those sculptures that are outside. Businesses, a lot of businesses have artworks as well, but go and look. And then when you're looking at it, you might do a process of describing what you see, analyzing what makes up the painting, like colors and lines and pattern, um, interpreting what is the artist's story? What do you think the artist was thinking? Or make up your own story about the art. And then finally, evaluate. How does the child feel about the work? Is this a piece of artwork they would love to display in their own home if they had it? Why or why not? Again, go deeper. Keep those questions open-ended. The fourth one, provide a space to create. You know, this, the most important about this is what is it that the family and the child values in terms of the space and where is a safe space for them to be able to create, right? They do need to be able to, um, you know, take responsibility in cleaning up and keeping it organized. Um, and we know that it doesn't always work for the child to have a permanent place to create, but where can they temporarily create? And outside is a great place to do it. Make those messes outside because it's a lot easier to clean it up with a hose or with a bucket of water. Uh, materials, this is probably something you heard from your art teacher this spring, anything can become art. So we just used a basic drawing tool and some paper surfaces today, but use the objects that are around you to arrange compositions or create sculptures. There's great resources out there on the internet about found object art or using your laundry to create art. Lori, I know you uh, really appreciated that idea, didn't you? So, yes, I did. Um, and also I like the idea of maybe getting into the recycling bin a little bit and turning what, what's there. And so I was thinking that might be a fun thing for me this afternoon. 
Oh, I think sculptures are a great thing, right? And even if you don't have tape or things like that to put them together, what other resources, right? Do you have twist ties? Do you have some yarn where you can punch holes and twist things together? So you just have to sometimes think a little differently, right? Yeah, and I think that's good for our noggins to try and think of creative ways to make art because those concepts of trying to work around problems will come in handy come everyday life. Yep. Yep, it'll go way beyond just creating art. I agree with you. And then the, la the sixth one and the final one is displaying creations. We know how important it is to present artwork. So in your home, location, location, location. Where is it that it's visible to the family and visitors? Where is a space that is valued by everyone in the family? And just like when you're creating, where is a safe space where it maybe won't be damaged by other siblings or by pets? So adults, I, I hope that uh, listening to these uh, six things might be helpful as you are trying to promote uh, uh, creativity within your home. Say, so, Renee, uh, were you able to see how did we handle sharing this resource before? I did, so I posted it in the chat. If you go to the Bright Lights webpage and we go to the, the flip side programs, you, your earlier camp was Dress Up and Draw and we yeah. posted it right there. I also put a link in the chat. So if um, people wanted to copy that and paste in a browser for later on, they can do that. Excellent, okay, very good, thank you. Uh, this resource hopefully can be helpful. And if you're re-watching the video, you can take down some of the ideas as well, of course. So. All right, uh, I just had the one citation, which was the video here. So uh, uh, I always, it's important to cite your work when you pull things from the internet or from books. And so mm -hmm. I made sure to cite those here. So our learning targets today were our hopes were as you were walking away, that you know a little bit about uh, the research and curiosity of Betty Edwards, that you understand there are strategies and techniques that will help you improve your drawing. And then hopefully you were able to practice all three of those techniques. So let's go back to that first question at the beginning. I did these paintings for my niece and I used a technique in order to draw these. So you're just gonna hold up a finger for which one you think it is. If you think I used upside down drawing, hold up one finger in the air. If you think I did blind contour, hold up two fingers in the air. And if you think I did continuous line contour, hold up three fingers. Lori, the spotlight's on you. Which one do you oh, think I used out of those three? I, I think it might be three. If anybody out there said three, you are correct. Now, some of you might have said number two, blind contour, and I totally get that um, because they do look really abstract and kind of unusual and weird, but I was actually looking at imagery, and this very first one actually is based on a photograph of my niece. So she sent me these two images she really liked, and then the third one I actually used her own face as kind of inspiration. I'm giving these to her Saturday for her birthday, because she'll be going back to college here in a few weeks. So uh, created these, these little paintings. So yes, continuous line contour is how I drew those. You know, Bright Lights loves to see what you're creating. So if you can take photos with a camera or a phone and an adult member has a Facebook uh, account, they can go to the Bright Lights Facebook page, go ahead and post underneath uh, the, the, uh, the posting about this class, put those images out there so that uh, we can see them. And you know, Laurie, I hope you and everybody who joined us today really enjoyed this. Take what it is that we learned today, right? The idea of practice. By practicing, you get better at something, whether it's drawing, playing soccer, or learning to read. All those are really, really important. I, I just want to, oh, go yeah. ahead. Sorry, Bob, no. I didn't mean to no. interrupt you. No, I just wanted you to okay. know that Katie wrote, she wishes this class would never end. So oh. I think you have some very um, satisfied artists out there. And I think that um, just, you know, I would tell Katie, remember, you can rewatch this later on on our YouTube page. And I, those resources are posted, but I just wanted to share that with you before you awesome. signed off. Awesome, thank you. Well, I just wanna take this moment to, first of all, thank the Bright Lights organization. What an amazing thing they've offered all summer long. Flipside, Lori, do you recall how many of these Flipside camps did we offer? Do you know the number? I think we were at 28. That is amazing. And for these to be free this summer, that's awesome. We're really hoping we can be back on site next summer uh, yep. over Lincoln with our classes, but for Bright Lights to provide these, 
kudos to Bright Lights and the board of directors for this. And Lori, I wanna thank you and I wanna thank Renee because I know it's been hard work all summer in helping uh, facilitate these, but what an amazing experience for our learners. I will have to say that I had just as much fun as the campers most days. So I, I really enjoyed it and it helped me to get to know uh, bright lights and our great teachers. We, we like to thought, thank Bob. And we look forward to seeing so many of you all next summer. Um, there, that seems like a long way away, but boy, the time will pass fast. And before you know it, we'll all be together again. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's all I have. Go out, draw, get better practice. Renee, did you have any closing words? That is it. I am just going to switch us back over to our closing screen. Um, you guys said everything I was thinking. Thank you, boys and girls, for being with us today. And thank you for supporting Bright Lights. And I sincerely hope I get to see your faces next summer when we are in person and um, have more fun. So enjoy the rest of your day. Go back to the Bright Lights page for resources and our YouTube channel to see um, any of the of the camps that Mr. Reeker did and um, yeah you guys have a great day and we'll see you later. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye, Bye friends.